All right, well, good afternoon. I'm gonna go ahead and start. It looks like we're live. Welcome to the American Burger Conservancy and North American Grouse Partnerships webinar, a new grassland program for ranching, wildlife, and the American public. The American Bird Conservancy's mission is to conserve wild birds and their habitats throughout the Americas. The Grouse Partnership's mission is to conservation of grouse and their habitats with a focus on prairie grouse since they're at a greatest risk. I'm Jody Provost, your North American Grouse Partnership Communications Director. Before we get started, here's a few housekeeping notes. The webinar will be recorded for instructions and captioning for today's event, plus see the chat. We encourage you to ask the speakers questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. Each speaker has a few minutes at the end of their talk to answer questions. We will be addressing questions from the chat as well as those submitted in advance. We will try our best to answer as many questions as possible, but if we don't get to your question during the webinar, we will get back to you later. We appreciate your understanding. We have an exciting panel of speakers who are going to jump right into things. First, I want to introduce Steve Riley, ABC's Director of Farm Bill Policy. Steve works to improve policies, especially those associated with the Farm Bill, that will improve conditions for birds, especially in grasslands. <clears throat> he received a Bachelor's in Science in Wildlife and Fisheries Sciences and a Master's in Science in Plant Ecology from South Dakota State University. Steve has worked on wildlife conservation issues throughout the Great Plains since the late 1980s. He formerly worked for the Northern Great Plains and Oaks and Prairies joint ventures via shared positions with Duck Ducks Unlimited and Texas Parks and Wildlife, respectively. He also served as a regional director for Pheasants Forever, assistant wildlife administrator for the Nebraska Games and Parks Commission, senior wildlife biologist for the South Dakota Department of Game, Fish and Parks, and as a biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Steve is joined today by his brother and Grouse Partnership Policy Director, Terry Riley. Although semi-retired, Terry stays busy with the consulting business. Highlights in Terry's career include working for the Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, Wildlife Management Institute, Iowa Department of Natural Resources, and the U.S. Forest Service. Terry has a bachelor's degree in Fish and Wildlife Biology from Kansas State University, a master's degree in wildlife science from New Mexico State University, where he studied the ecology of lesser prairie chickens, and a master's and doctorate degree in zoology from Ohio State University, where he studied the ecology of wetland invertebrates and waterfowl. The brothers join us today to share their expertise and talk about a new approach to conserving grasslands, one of the most threatened landscapes and homes to birds, such as the lesser prairie chicken. I will turn the floor over now to Steve to start the conversation. Hi there. I'm going to jump right into a few slides to kind of introduce the, the, the topic today and get some background material that will be helpful. I know a lot of the folks who are listening in know a lot about this already, but others may not know as much about some of the details. So I'm going to try to uh, catch everybody up uh, to a good spot. I'm going to share my screen. All right, you should be seeing my uh, presentation at this point in time. Um, I should start by saying, you know, there is not a new program at this moment in time. We're exploring the need for one, uh, and we think that we'll make a pretty good case here today that we need to do something differently than we're doing. Um, so I'm going to start out with a little bit of just why. Why does this matter? Well, our grasslands are in crisis, and one of the uh, emblematic uh, indicators of that crisis is that we've lost uh, we've lost 25 percent of the birds in North America since 1970, and half of the grassland birds since 1970. And we have uh, 70 species that are at the tipping point, uh, meaning that uh, they're uh, becoming rare enough that they might. Uh, end up on the endangered species, threatened species list. Um, some examples, of course, in the in the prairie would be lesser prairie chicken, western meadowlark, that sort of thing. Another thing you need to have a little bit of background in is how grasslands were formed. If we're talking about how to manage, manage them, it's important to know that uh, grasslands occur generally in temperate climates with varying and variable uh, annual precipitation. So we might have a, a, a 
13 inch rainfall zone, but in any given year, they might get five or six or, or 20. Uh, so there's a lot of variability in the moisture. Um, the grasslands evolved with uh, extensive populations at times of large roaming and grazing herbivores. Uh, bison, elk, deer, and pronghorn are among those. And most importantly, uh, for a lot of these grasslands were the plains of bison that uh, really helped to shape the grasslands themselves and the plant materials and how they work. Um, there were also often uh, extensive and frequent wildfires fires that helped to shape uh, the soils and the plant communities and how the, the, terrest the uh, vertebrate communities used those as well as the invertebrates. <coughs> so that's enough kind of on you know, how the, the prairies kind of came to be and some of the things we need to consider if we're going to manage them. Now I'll toss out a few really basic principles of range management. Now there are those who throw out the notion that maybe we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't graze the grasslands. Maybe if we took the cattle off, it would be better. But really what range management does uh, is to try to emulate what uh, what it made the prairies evolve in the first place. So part of that emulation is to make sure that there are grazers out there and are in many cases our best grazer uh, that we have uh, available are our cattle. Um, but it, you know there are others as well. And we try to use those cattle to manage the vegetation to emulate the natural processes. The basic idea is to take ap actions uh, largely with how we are grazing that will help the vegetation uh, become healthy, resilient, and productive and help the, the, the landowner make a profit so that hopefully we keep them on the land and the grass green side up and not turned into cropland or something else. Some of the real basic principles of range management is how we, you know, what, what, what are the tools that we can use to adjust uh, grazing pressure. And some of that is the timing of the grazing, grazing when we start cattle on a pasture, when we take them off, how long they're on the pasture, the duration, the intensity, or how many livestock we have. Uh, the frequency of grazing is important. Do we graze that once a year or every other year or twice a year or four times a year? Those were important, <laughs> important tools for building grazing management plans. So we'll be talking about some of that as we go through. And finally, uh, distribution of the livestock is important, and we facilitate that with things like fences, uh, water, uh, they, they like to be near water, and minerals and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and that really gives you the, the background you need on range management so that we can talk a little bit more about what a program might need to look like. So part of the problem we have out in, in the, our grasslands, of which we have about 600 million acres left in the United States, that varies from very, uh, very dry grasslands like the one in the picture to very wet grasslands like the tall grass prairie, but they all share a lot of the same needs, uh, uh, just at varying degrees. But one of the big problems we've had is that traditionally we use uh, we use a season long grazing. That was always traditionally how grazing was done. Now, the season is kind of dependent upon the, the weather. If you're, near North, if you're in North Dakota, that may only be uh, six or seven months. If you're in Texas, they may keep the cattle in the same pasture uh, all the time, year after year after year. The problem with that is, uh, and what we're trying to move away from, is moving so that we we control that use, uh, as I described before, with range management principles, uh, and uh, trying to balance the the pressure that the livestock produce with what the ecological capacity of the land is. Um, and just bear in mind that if we're in more arid regions it's more challenging. Uh, obviously, uh, we, it, takes long, it, it doesn't take as long to damage the, the plants and the soil, and it takes longer for them to heal is the basic principle there. Um, when we do overuse, we contribute to the long-term reduction in productivity. Uh, we often lose uh, desired forage species that are replaced or largely replaced by invasive plants that don't perform the same way. Um, native plant structure, function, heterogeneity is often reduced. 
uh, which affects wildlife habitat as well as the ability for the grassland to produce food for livestock and other plant, other wildlife. Uh, biodiversity and soil health often decline when we have poor grazing systems or you know when we revert to the season long grazing. And uh, I throw this last bit in there because I think a lot of times the it, rather than having a robust, well thought out plan for how to move cattle around and how to determine how much pressure you're using, a lot of times historically the the plan has been more of oh I'm out of grass I need to move my grass maybe I need to rent a pasture maybe I need to start feeding hay uh, that we bailed something like that but what we're talking about is much more proactive. Now, just to give you a little bit of a sense of what we're talking about in a practical manner, this is obviously a very arid piece of grassland. This happens to be in uh, southwest Texas. And if you notice, on the uh, left side of the fence, there's an awful lot of rocks there, not a lot of soil available, and the plants are pretty scarce. On the right side of the fence, what's happened here, even though both of these pastures honestly have been uh, overutilized for a long period of time, the landowner on the right has started implementing uh, a more modern grazing system. And you can already see the benefits of that in that we have a, a little bit of grass out there and we have some opportunity to do some better management. And if you're, you know, if you're a bird trying to find a place to nest or hide, uh, obviously you want to be on the right side of this fence. This is a different uh, fence line contrast. This happens to be in the eastern part of the Tallgrass Prairie in Nebraska. And what you'll notice here is that both sides of the fence is, is, uh, represent pretty good wildlife habitat. Birds could hide or nest in this in this habitat, uh, depending on the species and what their needs are, both of uh, both of these look pretty good. And it, it's important to note that the you know the primary tall species here on the right is Indian grass, and it's headed out. So this is well into the summer, uh, based on the phenology of this plant. Uh, it's pretty green, probably got some rain, uh, but because of superior management, the plant community is in much better health. So uh, think about you know where the where could where could birds uh, nest, roost, hide from predators, those kinds of things. And uh, again, in that previous uh, slide, be pretty tough. So getting back to kind of our point today for a program, what we what we think is necessary is that we need to be able to improve, increase the amount of uh, rest, if you will, or the amount of recovery period that pastures have uh, so that we can have more grass on the landscape. Um, of course, most of this land is privately owned. And uh, when we're when we're talking about that, we're talking about asking a private citizen to change the way they're managing their grasslands. And in order to facilitate that, we really need some financial incentives. Um, but what we're really talking about incentivizing is a recovery period where we don't have livestock use. Um, that recovery period will enable those native plants to grow and become more vigorous. We know we'll get better bird population recruitment, better nesting and, and brood rearing. Uh, we know that if we uh, are able to rotate among pastures, uh, if a for instance, a landowner has several pastures and you're able to uh, have a recovery period on one pasture while the other ones are in use, that that on that ranch will make the ranch uh, better for wildlife, but also uh, we'll see more uh, resilience in that, in that grassland. We'll provide better plant structure, better variety, better heterogeneity. And you can only imagine that if this was replicated across a bunch of ranches in the same landscape, that we would have a bunch of pastures that are near one another that are in this recovery period. So we would have more grass available for birds as well as other ecosystem services. And we'll have a lot more intact uh, landscape uh, for that whole area. Some of the benefits is that when we store uh, more uh, 
energy in the root system. We create a reserve that can be used during crises such as drought, where those plants can maybe uh, take a little bit more pressure uh, while we're trying to get through that drought. Um, and extended recovery periods may be required in some places to accomplish the landowner's goals and maybe uh, you know, the USDA's goals or whoever is providing for the program uh, it might need to be a year, might need to be several years in some places to accomplish what we need. But ultimately, we're trying to restore the plant communities, the soil health and the ecological functions. And as a side benefit, we'll store more carbon. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of what we're talking about, uh, that what a program might look like. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Terry for some details about some of the other programs that can provide some of the things we're talking about, but don't quite get to where we want to go. So we're really talking about providing financial incentives for you know, one to three years of recovery in any given pasture. And you can see the, the wagon wheel that I have here. It's pretty simple. I'm going to keep this very, very simple. We can make it a lot more complex if we need to. But in this situation, we're talking about uh, a program that would be similar to CRP, but we would only be providing a payment on a pasture that was in that recovery period. And so you can see that the the we have five pastures and we have a 10-year contract. Uh, we would rest in year one and year six in pasture one, and we would kind of rotate around that, that wagon wheel so that all the pastures are benefiting and the whole ranch is benefiting uh, through time. And uh, we're, we're helping to provide more, uh, more health to that uh, grassland system. Um, so something like this would you know the, the example we have here would take a 10-year contract but if you imagine that maybe we're in a, a more arid area maybe we're in a, pat, a system that's seen much more abuse and maybe we need to have uh, a couple of years of rest in each of these pastures and run it through twice that would easily make it a 20-year program so we'd need a, a the ability to have longer term contracts good news is on this model, uh, even though it's similar to CRP, we're only paying for the pastures that are rested, not the entire ranch. So it's uh, it's fairly cheap. And like that, uh, that uh, insurance com commercial, you only pay for what you need here. Um, and this obviously provides the producer the ability to set some long-term goals and have some assurance that they're going to get some incentives to help them build that build that out and get the outcomes that they want. Uh, we'll be able to develop monitoring protocols and more robust plans that we can adjust on the fly to make sure that we're meeting the objectives that we set out to meet. And that's the end of my slides. I'm going to stop sharing and turn this over to Terry. There you go. Take it over, brother. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. And I hope you can hear and see what we're trying to portray here. Um, one of the things our focus has been on is that we can't save um, grassland bird declines or, or turn them around uh, with programs like CRP because it's, it's a very expensive program and it's cost as much as $2 billion a year in some years when we used to have a lot of acres enrolled. Uh, and we're in a, at a situation right now where if we don't do something with the existing grasslands, the ones that are still native prairies that are primarily uh, used for grazing uh, livestock, uh, we will not be able to turn uh, the, the declines for grassland birds around and make it, uh, you know, some increases. Um, CRP, the Conservation Reserve Program, if you don't know what that is, allows farmers and ranchers to enroll in the program for 10 to 15 years. And basically they put conservation cover on their land um, and, re and replace row crops primarily um, uh, with that conservation cover. And then they keep it idle in that conservation cover for up to 10 to 15 years. And then they receive an annual rental payment from USDA um, at the beginning of October each year. <clears throat> and that really does have, add a lot of stability from a financial standpoint for a lot of ranchers that have to live otherwise with up and down, uh, uh, basically, you know, 
the, the price of corn or other things drives their income uh, stability. And uh, as, as time goes on, sometimes it's almost impossible to make a profit and other, other years it's better. But what we'd like to do is have something similar to CRP uh, as Steve described, that actually where you could pay uh, an incentive payment to a rancher again on October 1st to rest pastures as Steve had described. And of course, we have no idea how USDA or uh, Congress will come forward with uh, a program uh, that we're looking for and how it will be structured. It could be just for specific regions where we have real problem, like say the Great Plains, or it could be for the entire country. Uh, and any farmer that, or any rancher that wants to improve their pastures and the health of their pastures, they could sign up for uh, the, this program and basically uh, try to improve uh, a variety of things, including habitat for ground nesting birds. And that's, that's the real problem is our ground nesting birds are really impacted by grazing. They're impacted by uh, all the activities that go on uh, in the Great Plains because there's very few trees uh, to impede what happens. So we mow and we hay and we uh, uh, farm it. Uh, and so ground nesting birds have a really tough time. Um, and what we want we know what what works and that's we've done quite a bit of research on crp so if you leave it idle for 10 or 15 years some good conservation cover we do get a lot of uh, re response from a lot of the ground nesting birds um, meadowlarks and others and so but we don't have any research now on uh, on the existing programs or at least i mean the the programs that we're proposing but at, at least we have um a few areas uh that around the country, uh, particularly, here, particularly here in the Great Plains, where uh, some public lands have been managed under a system where they do rest pastures and, and to, to improve the health and to get uh, ground nesting bird uh, recruitment up to a higher level than it's been. So I'll stop there and we'll start answering questions. Um, and I know it's, it can be complicated. And we do have a piece of legislation that we've drafted uh, just so that we can kind of shop that around among legislators and even farmers, I, I mean ranchers, to see what they actually uh, are interested in doing. And we've had some positive responses from both USDA and a few Congress, a few people in Congress and from some of the ranchers about how we move forward with this, this idea. I'll turn it over to Jody now and she'll be able to deal with the questions. All right, thank you very much, Steve and Terry. Yeah, so we'll take some questions now and we're gonna start off with a few um, that were sent prior to the webinar, um, questions that people sent ahead of time. And, uh, and then after we do a few of those, Annie will take over and do some of the live questions. Um, so to start off, I guess one question that was asked previously and also here was, if you could describe a little bit more about what CRP is. Um, Steve, you wanna try that one? Sure. Yeah, CRP is a, one of the uh, conservation programs that's authorized under the Farm Bill that it has several different parts to it. But essentially, as Terry mentioned, it started out as a way to uh, retire temporarily uh, cropland by putting it back into a permanent cover, mostly uh, grassland cover. There were some areas where it was trees, but for what we're talking about, mostly grass and cover. Um, there are just a, a little bit more in the weeds on that. Uh, generally, we have what's known as the general sign up, where we can sign up large blocks of farmland. We also have a continuous sign up, which really means that the lands we're signing up are so environmentally sensitive, you can enroll them anytime. The, the general sign up only happens once in a while. A continuous sign up goes on and on. So if you have something that qualifies, you can enroll it. And generally looking at things that are pretty sensitive, might be a water quality area, uh, something next to a stream, or it might be a really important piece of uh, wildlife habitat, but they're generally smaller acreages. Um, there's a, I could go more into detail there, but I won't. 
more lately, what we've seen is a, a new part of CRP called grassland CRP, which is really geared for grasslands and not farmland. Uh, the problem is that grassland CRP, while it pays for uh, an annual incentive uh, for all the acres enrolled, um, it doesn't really require a lot of additional conservation. So the landowner is really being enrolled so that they will uh, be incentivized to keep the land in grazing, uh, not to necessarily adopt a better grazing system. We think we could make some adjustments to grass and CRP to make it better, but for now, that's that's kind of what CRP is. And again, it's been great. We've had as many as like 38 million acres enrolled of grassland throughout the history of the program. Uh, and it's, you know, we've, we've seen some really important uh, responses from wildlife. Uh, because of grassland CRP, which is now about a third of the acres, program is now limited to 27 million acres and about 9 million acres is in grassland CRP. We're, we're kind of concerned that we're losing ground, uh, losing uh, grasslands in the program. And like Terry said, the program is becoming more and more expensive. Uh, grassland CRP is an exception to that. I'll leave it at that. All right. Thank you, Steve. Another common question was, can this program be used elsewhere, you know, around the United States, or is it meant just for out west? Terry, you want to try that one? Sorry, I got a big windstorm here in Colorado, and it's probably going to bump me off again. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Basically, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we still have to work this, the way the, the legislation is written right now, the draft legislation that we put together, uh, it would be available for anybody, any uh, rancher that runs cattle on native prairie that wants to uh, improve their habitat uh, and improve their operation by uh, resting or, or recovering the health of, of those pastures. And basically, uh, it's a voluntary program and, and base, the basic premise is it would be like CRP, it's voluntary, uh, but it'd have more flexibility to deal with the type of stuff that we need for grassland birds and to improve the health of, of the native prairie. All right. Okay, another question was, how does this program relate to federal state agencies and other NGOs current programs to conserve grassland habitat. Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, the uh, There are a number of programs that aim to do this. There's nothing that is remotely like rocket science here. We're just trying to do what uh, has been, uh, you know, attempted uh, for a long time. Uh, NRCS is, has spent an awful lot of time and years working with producers to institute uh, new and better grazing systems. They provide incentives for all sorts of uh, uh, assistance to help put in additional fences, water sources, things like that, as well as just putting together a robust plan. But it's oftentimes hard to get people to adopt those because we don't pay for this extra step. Uh, it costs money to get started in this uh, foregone income is what they call it when you uh, jump into a grazing system until the, the productivity jumps up. So we have programs like EQIP uh, and uh, and even uh, conservation uh, stewardship program that help to pay for some of those things, but they just don't go far enough. Um, there's a, the federal agencies that have federal lands often have programs of the Forest Service with their national grasslands, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service with some of the refuges uh, have really done a great job of instituting some of these same principles uh, and have seen some great results from them. Places like the Fort Pier National Grasslands or Valentine National Wildlife Refuge are a couple that come to mind where they've institute these, instituted these same kinds of programs. But like I said, it's not rocket science. We're just talking about trying to expand this to a much broader uh, region and to provide the incentives that would really entice landowners to come to the table to put these uh, grazing systems into practice more. All right. 
And I'll do one more question, then we'll have Annie do some of the questions that are coming in live. Um, how about, is this program going to benefit other species besides imperiled grassland birds? Terry? Yes, um, obviously uh, the grazers, the, the native grazers, such as uh, pronghorn, um, deer obviously uh, will graze pretty heavily when there's a lot of green grass around. Um, there are a lot of the rodents, uh, good or bad, uh, will benefit just because there's a lot better habitat out there and they're not as easily picked off by coyotes and foxes and bobcat. Um, uh, the birds in general uh, that utilize grasslands, not all uh, birds nest necessarily in grasslands, but they use them uh, for feeding and, and other things. And so, the, yes, there would be lots of benefits for uh, additional species that utilize grassland, uh, native prairies primarily. And I'd just throw in an addition. I mean, this is kind of the rising tide that lifts all boats. So if we improve the grassland community and make it as we started off with, if it emulates more the natural processes, we'll see the invertebrates, uh, the insects, the pollinators benefit, and uh, and we'll see all of the vertebrate community that is supposed to be there benefit from a, a healthier system. All right. Okay. Annie Chester, the American Bird Conservancy Policy Initiatives Coordinator, is going to take care of some of our live questions coming in now. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for submitting questions. We got quite a few, so I'll try to work through as many as we have time. So the first question that came in, Steve and Terry, was someone asked, moving cattle very frequently, um, such as in certain biomes, one to two times per day in small paddocks, um, giving no less than 60 days rest seems to work very well. Is this too much of an ask to push for that level of rotation in a new program? So maybe if you could kind of discuss what level of rotation you're talking about. Well, I think that's a great question. It gets pretty deep uh, into the design of a grazing system. Uh, and, you know, the answer is going to be it depends. But ultimately, it, it, it you've got to think about what your goals are. And if the goals of the producer is to uh, have healthier, more resilient grasslands that they can depend on uh, year in and year out, uh, irrespective of drought conditions or wet conditions, uh, then they need to uh, they need to kind of synchronize those objectives with the what the land can tolerate. And some of that can be achieved in multiple ways. If your objectives go beyond that to, I wanna have more grass on nesting birds, well, then you need to synchronize those, uh, the timing of what you're doing with the needs of those grass on nesting birds. To a large degree, what we're talking about with this program would be to kickstart a, uh, a new grazing system so that you're incentivizing the landowner to not only adopt it, but use it for long enough that they get used to it and that the product productivity of the land increases and stabilizes so that they can continue to use it, perhaps without needing uh, additional uh, incentives. Uh, in other areas where maybe we've got an endangered ground nesting bird, maybe it's uh, the lesser prairie chicken, for example, uh, you may need to take more, a uh, greater action. And so if what we're talking about is paying for the landowner to leave more grass than they normally would, well, then we need to pay them an adequate amount for, to incentivize them to do that. And so a lot of what we start talking about in a situation like that is making sure that we have adequate residual cover in that pasture coming into the spring so that the birds will select the, the right pasture as a nesting uh, site. And then to leave that dormant uh, or in a, in a kind of a rested period throughout the, the nesting and brood rearing season so that they have the, you know, maximize the recruitment of those birds into the population. And that's a little bit different than uh, what maybe the, the the person who asked the question was intending. Uh, you may not want to, in a situation like that, be uh, rotating livestock uh, in every pasture, uh, you know, daily or every couple of days. That might not synchronize with the objectives. 
Thanks, Steve. Um, along the lines of something you mentioned during that answer is incentive payments. So a few people asked if you've kind of fleshed out what the incentive payments might look like. Would they include pasture infrastructure like fencing, water, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. We already have some uh, incentives out there for those kinds of uh, practices through the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Um, and we uh, definitely, you know, if you're building a, a, a new grazing system, you've got to take those things into account and, and help the producer uh, make those transitions. So yes, uh, this program might not do it, but, uh, you know, it, if we uh, do something like this right, we're going to have those tools available so that, uh, I mean, it wouldn't do us a lot of good to uh, build someone a uh, a, graze, a new grazing plan and then not help them uh, put all the pieces into place. And that's kind of what we're talking about here is right now you can build a grazing plan and you can put new fence in and new uh, water sources and get it kind of set up, but we don't pay enough of uh, for the transition process for the foregone income. So that that's kind of what we're trying to add to what is already available. Yeah, thanks for that, Steve. Um, another question that came in earlier was in terms of compliance, how would how would you verify compliance under this program if you've thought about that at all? You can take that one, Terry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I, I have a, my video. No, kick me out. Can you still hear me? Yep. There you okay, go. Okay. Well, my video kicked out. But um, one thing to think to remember about the uh, the draft the draft legislation we have, it would actually if we're asking a, a rancher to do something that's above and beyond what they normally would do, uh, and it has benefits for the general public, uh, and, and obviously having healthy ecosystems out there is a benefit. Um, we, we have actually said that if there's enough benefits that the 100% of the cost of putting in whatever improvements are necessary would be paid for by, uh, by the program. Thanks for that answer, Terry. Um... Sorry, I'm just looking for the next question. Uh, here we go. So someone asked, um, how would a program like this work alongside existing programs? Um, uh, someone mentioned Audubon's Conservation Ranching Program and uh, similar programs like that. Yeah, that's a great question. Audubon Ranching uh, really espouses a lot of the same principles that we're talking about. And the way it would work in conjunction with Audubon Ranching is that if you were a uh, rancher who was enrolled in Audubon Ranching, uh, you wouldn't be necessarily excluded from using uh, this program on top of that. I think that, uh, you know, or kind of vice versa, if you got enrolled in this program and started seeing uh, greater benefits uh, in your grassland and could get uh, accepted into Audubon Ranching, uh, that should go uh, very well together. I don't think that they uh, conflict. Uh, probably the only place you'd run into problem is if somebody has too much wealth uh, and is uh, precluded from using the programs in the first place. Yeah, and in terms of kind of getting this program off the ground, folks are asking a lot about how do they get their members of Congress engaged um, who are some of the legislators that might be interested in this and how might this all connect with Farm Bill as well? You want to take a shot at that, Terry? You're on mute. Okay, now I'm back again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, right now what we're trying to do is find a sponsors for the legislation and get as much information from all the participants, like I said, ranchers and politicians uh, and you know other people just so we can get the legislation fine tuned. And then we do have a few uh, people, that, a few legislators that have shown interest, but obviously we're getting ready to go into another congressional cycle here next year. Um, and obviously the farm bill is probably already uh, ready to go uh, with respect to um, 
being signed into law probably next year. Uh, so we may not have any chance to actually get this into this into the new farm bill, but we hope to build a group of co-sponsors for the bill. Uh, and then once we have some co-sponsors, we can actually uh, send out messages to everybody and ask them to contact their legislators to join on as co-sponsors. That's the kind of the process to work with Congress on this. And it takes a while to get these programs instituted and everybody's got questions just like we have on the call today uh, about how it would work and who's going to do it and how are we going to pay for it and does the, is the government going to play an a, a active role there's just lots and lots of questions uh, ranchers typically are very independent and we've got to get beyond that issue also so that they trust government and are willing to enter in a, into contracts with the government to actually uh, do something over a long period of time yeah, I guess along with that, maybe Steve, you can uh, build off of this. Is there tangible ways that folks on this call can engage with certain legislators or kind of help progress this idea? Yeah, I think the big thing is that what we're talking about, you know, because ranching and the, what ranchers do on their land is a little bit uh, of a mystery to a lot of the, the country. And even a lot of conservationists that are familiar with working in other settings don't aren't really familiar with working uh, on active ranches. One of the one of the key things is getting people to think about this more uh, more broadly. I think uh, a, a rancher that we work with down in uh, Lesser Prairie Chicken Country said it best by saying that you know we're not going to have any more Lesser Prairie chickens uh, unless we have more grass for them to nest and raise their broods in. And we're not gonna have any more grass for them to nest and raise their broods in unless somebody pays the ranchers uh, to leave that grass out there. And it's really as simple as that. It's a matter of how do we find, uh, how do we build a program that will address that? The great news in ranch country, uh, rental rates are really cheap compared to farm country. And uh, that coupled with the fact that we're only talking about paying a rental payment on actual rested pastures uh, makes it even cheaper yet. So it's very cheap program. And because we're not having to restore the habitat, all we need to do is give it a little more tender, loving care. We can see big benefits really quickly without having to pay for restoration costs. So it's pretty, pretty important. And I wanted to back up. I know you asked the question a while ago, uh, Annie, about monitoring and how would you monitor a program like this? Primarily, we're talking about full annual rest. Uh, now, it could evolve into something else. We we don't control what Congress do, does, but uh, we, can, we can make recommendations. But if it were to come out the way we're talking about, you would rest for the full annual cycle or more. And monitoring becomes fairly easy then because you can tell whether cattle have been in a pasture based on whether there's any fresh cow pies, for instance. So it's uh, monitoring, uh, if we do it right, could be pretty pretty easy, not to mention the fact that at the end of the season, you're going to have a uh, pretty robust uh, uh, you know, plant community that uh, goes into senescence in the wintertime uh, without you know, having been disturbed. Thanks, Steve. Um, I guess for this next question, I want to, since you kind of brought us back to the nitty gritty of the uh, idea, is how would other wildlife, like things like wildlife corridors and endangered species be factored into this new program? Terry, you want to take that one? Yes, but uh, my video is giving me trouble. <laughs> um, I, the way um, we would address this issue is we'd work with the state fish and wildlife agencies and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to actually uh, identify which species are critical to what they their you know their oper their programs and stuff. So obviously, Fish and Wildlife Service deals with threatened and endangered species, but we also have about twelve thousand species that have been identified in need of conservation by the states. Uh, in their state wildlife action plan. So we have a lot of species to address and, and what we would probably do is start going down those uh, lists with the state 
agencies and the federal agencies to see how this program might actually benefit those, those species that are in need uh, for better conservation. Yeah, and as for the, the part of the question that deals with, you know, its compatibility with wildlife corridor, uh, a lot of those that are starting to emerge where we have uh, migratory big game primarily that need to move about the landscape and have uh, appropriate fences to be able to do that. This should work quite well with that. The, you know, the, with when we're talking about uh, wildlife corridors, a lot of times we're not necessarily all that concerned with changing the grazing practices. We just wanna make sure that movement is allowed, but there's no reason that you couldn't do both. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, I, another question that just came in was someone asked, would the program include payments for public land acres? Um, would that, how would that be factored in? Well, it, in the past, when we've worked uh, with Congress on that issue, uh, one of the ways we've dealt with it is to say that uh, if the the land, whether it's public or private, is part of a, a private grazing operation, uh, then it would be eligible for uh, some, uh, some funding from this program uh, or even from some of the other existing programs. I think EQIP talks just about whether it's uh, part of a private uh, operation, which many of the public lands are for service and BLM, uh, the, the lands, uh, the land, uh, the public land administered by those two agencies typically is leased out to ranchers to graze. So um, it could be, uh, it's, we've had some pilots uh, in Arizona and New Mexico where we've actually spent some money from the Environmental Quality Incentives Program to work with uh, improving the, the public lands down there um, and use that concept, um, it, but it's not it's still not widespread. So uh, I don't know how we would fo force Congress to do that. <laughs> I do think it's a fabulous question because we do have this issue of, uh, particularly in the West, where we have a lot of uh, public lands, whether they're uh, BLM or uh, Forest Service or whatever, uh, that are part of grazing leases. And I'm guessing that's part of what the, the asker is uh, kind of getting at. And these are often incorporated in a ranch that has both private and public lands commingle. And the, the livestock herd is uh, rotated often throughout a system of both public and private land. And that calls into a, you know, a whole nother series of questions about how do you deal with that? A question that we've received is, well, wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't they just move their cattle over onto the public land and abuse that more? Uh, you know, and that, you know, that, that you know, is a very practical question. How do we deal with that? And I think to a certain degree, we have to understand that, uh, you know, the devil that we know is not necessarily any better than the devil that we don't know yet. Um, and we're already dealing with these kinds of problems. And maybe this begs the question, uh, shouldn't we be doing this in a more incorporated fashion so that we're, you know, we're getting the kind of benefit that we're asking for? Yeah, absolutely. And since we're still kind of talking about like what land might qualify in certain criteria, a few people also asked about uh, what what would be eligible grasslands because grasslands have been altered. So, um, you know, non-native or native species and yeah, where do native species kind of fit into this? Yeah, I'm not Terry, do you have enough bandwidth to start that? The, um, the draft legislation talks about native prairie. Of course, it's pretty hard to necessarily define native prairie. Usually, if it's, if it's not native, it's been plowed or something of that nature. So you turn, turned over the, the native uh, plants and started all over with something new. Uh, corn or you know a, a tame grass that's brought in from Europe or something. Um, so it is focused on native prairie, um, and uh, I assume that 
uh, if NRCS, uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, got this program and they and it says Native Prairie, they would probably define that better uh, than what Congress would do. I just add that you know, from a, the standpoint of ecosystem services, we're always going to be way farther ahead if we have Native Prairie because. As I said before, we don't have to restore it, and we're already getting this broad suite of of services from that native prairie. If you know Congress chose to make this open to tame pastures as well, you know we would probably try to figure out a way to help uh, improve those tame pastures so that they provide more ecosystem services. Uh, you know, an awful lot of those tame pastures are. Uh, fairly nearly uh, monocultures, which, uh, you know, we don't have much of a robust ecosystem. If, our, if we only have one plant species, we're not going to have a lot of invertebrates or vertebrates that respond to that. And so it would be better if it was native, but it, if it also uh, be created leverage to put some of the tame pastures back into native, that would be a good thing too. Yeah. Uh, so I think we're kind of running short on time. So I think this will be the last question. And that is, uh, someone asked, this This program sounds like it might be connected to the sage grouse initiative. Can you talk a little bit more about um, kind of how this would fit in with that and how that program might also serve as um, a model or an example? Well, I'll, I'll start the question to, or the answer, Terry, you can finish it up. I would say, first of all, understand that not all grasslands are created equal uh, and sage country uh, evolved a little bit differently than what I described at the beginning of the talk. Uh, we didn't have bison uh, in much of uh, sagebrush country. And so that uh, evolutionary process was different. We also have a lot less moisture uh, so soil development suffered through the eons uh, in that way as well. So while we may be able to uh, create some uh, shorter relative periods of rest in the mixed grass prairie and achieve our results with, uh, you know, kind of our basic model of doing a one year rest and rotating it through twice over a 10 year contract, we might be able to get some good results from that. Uh, in other prairies, uh, sage, uh, the sage step may be one of these. We would expect that it would take longer to get the same kind of results and maybe a lot longer. Yeah, the sage, sage brush uh, is, is a phenomenon that we have, we have to deal with uh, with regard to a whole bunch of brushy uh, grasslands. Uh, there are quite a few different kinds, including uh, several varieties of sagebrush grasslands. Um, and it's obvious that it's very difficult to go in there and restore uh, grasses that are um, that have been lost because you can't go in and drill them in uh, or you'll tear the sagebrush all to pieces. So we're still doing some research with uh, USG, US Ge Geological Survey on how we uh, bring some of like the bunch grasses back to a lot of the sagebrush country that provided good nesting cover for sage grouse, but have been eliminated because they're kind of a ice cream plant for cattle and they've been grazed for 150 years and they don't, they have to have basically a seed opportunity. Uh, they have to produce seed and, and spread their seeds. But if you always put the cattle on during the seed growing period uh, and graze it all off, they never get to reproduce and spread. So it's been a problem with, with bunch grasses over large portions of the sagebrush country. And the same problem occurs with a lot of the other shrubby uh, or brushy uh, grasslands. Yeah, and just to add to that, that one of our big problems in the sage step is invasive annual grasses. And uh, they tend to respond differently than we might see, say, in the mixed grass prairie, where there's a lot, uh, the system allows for more competition. But the way the those annual uh, invasive grasses mostly introduced uh, the way they function in the sage step is that they kind of get the first sunlight and the first water in the spring and take over the site. So resting doesn't necessarily get you where you need to go unless you treat those plants first because you're just going to uh, benefit them further. 
Yeah. Um, so we're down to the last few minutes here. I'll just real quickly mention that a couple other folks asked questions about how water usage and conserving groundwater fits into all of this. That's a big uh, last question to throw out, but if you could maybe address that um, very quickly, I think we can close out with that. Now, I'd just say that uh, healthy grassland systems are going to uh, store water better than an unhealthy one. Uh, and, you know, that's probably going to that's probably the simplest answer that uh, it's just it's just going to be we have a healthier root system. It's going to store more water, hold it on the land longer. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. And of course, I know question time ran out quickly, but. Um, there's always a chance to uh, reach out to either Terry or Steve, and I'll uh, turn it out, turn it over to Jody to close it out for us. All right. Well, we want to be mindful of people's time and wrap it up. And so, thank you very much to everyone for the very thought-provoking questions. We especially want to thank Steve and Terry. For more information about what we discussed today, we encourage you to visit the American Bird Conservancy and North American Grouse Partnerships websites. Or you can also reach out via email to Steve or Terry, and their emails are sriley at abcbirds.org and triley at grousepartners.org, and Riley is R-I-L-E-Y. And so that concludes our webinar today, and we hope you all have a good one. Thank you for joining us.